Here we are exploring a theorem that looks specifically at the divergence of a radial vector field. So for all real numbers p, the divergence of a vector field such that vector f is the radial field of the following form. So we define this radial field vector f as vector r by the magnitude of vector r raised to the pth power and this is equivalent to the vector with components x, y, z, all divided by the magnitude. So we have x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and this is all raised to the p over 2. So the divergence of this vector field, this radial vector field, is defined as follows. So we have the divergence of vector f is still equal to the dot product of del and the vector field, but this is going to be equal to 3 minus that scalar or that constant p, all divided by the magnitude of vector x, ra uh, vector r raised to the pth power. So this is a nice shortcut that we can use when we're working with radial fields of this given form. So now that we have established the theorem for the divergence of a radial vector field, we need to prove it to ourselves. So here we go. So again, we're given that radial vector field of the following form. So we are given the radial field defined as vector f. And we know vector f is in space. We have components f, g, h. And this radial field is defined by vector r over the magnitude of vector r raised to the p power. And so we say that this is equal to vector x, y, z. And that's all over x squared plus y squared plus z squared raised to the p over 2. So... We need to compute the divergence of this radial field. So again, keeping in mind, we can recall, we know that the divergence of a vector field in general is defined as the dot product of the del operator with the vector field. And this is equal to the sum of the partial derivatives. So we have the partial derivative of f with respect to x, partial derivative of g with respect to y, and the partial derivative of h with respect to z. So because we have such a big function here, I want to begin by thinking about this component by component. So we need to find the individual partial derivatives for each component. Just like we did in a previous example. So our first component is the f component. So f here is defined as x all over. We have x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and that's all raised to the p over 2. And then we'll give ourselves plenty of room. And so when you are taking the partial derivative here with respect to x, you can again either use the quotient rule or the product rule with the chain rule. So I'm going to use my quotient rule. So the partial derivative of f with respect to x is going to be 1 multiplied by x squared plus y squared plus z squared, all raised to the p over 2, minus x multiplied by p divided by 2, multiplied by x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and this is now raised to the p over 2 minus 1, multiplied by the derivative of the inside with respect to x, which is just 2x, and this is all over the denominator squared. So we have x squared plus y squared plus z squared raised to the p over 2, and we need to square this. And so we can simplify here. We can rewrite this actually in the numerator. First things first, we have those twos that will cancel each other out. 
So this is going to leave us with x squared plus y squared plus z squared raised to the p over 2 minus x squared times p multiplied by x squared plus y squared plus z squared raised to the p over 2 minus 1. And now in our denominator here, notice within the brackets that we have a power of 1 half. And on the outside, we have the power of 2. So those will cancel each other out, leaving us with x squared plus y squared plus z squared, all raised to the p power. And so at this point, we can continue simplifying. Notice in the numerator, we have a greatest common factor here of x squared plus y squared plus z squared raised to the p over 2. So let's factor that out to the front of our numerator. So we have x squared plus y squared plus z squared all raised to the p divided by 2. And this is now multiplied by what's left over, which is 1 minus x squared times p multiplied by x squared plus y squared plus z squared all raised to the negative 1. And this is still divided by that same denominator, x squared plus y squared plus z squared raised to the p power. And so we can simplify the greatest common factor that we factored out in our numerator with the denominator. So the numerator, the term in the numerator goes to 1, and it cancels with p over 2 terms of our denominator. So we are left here with 1 minus x squared times p, all multiplied by x squared plus y squared plus z squared, raised to the negative 1, and this is all divided by x squared plus y squared plus z squared raised to the p over 2. And so what I want to do now is remind you that here we're given our vector r is defined by the components x, y, z. And we also know that from this vector, we have the length or the magnitude of vector r is defined as the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, which we, of course, know by now is equivalent to x squared plus y squared plus z squared raised to the 1 half, which we, again, we see that 1 half in our denominator here. Additionally, if you take this magnitude equation and you square both sides of it, we end up with the magnitude of vector r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Right? The square and the square root cancel each other out. So we can now use these two equations to simply or to substitute into our partial derivative. Right, one in the numerator and one in the denominator to make this look a little bit nicer to read. So we can rewrite our partial derivative of f with respect to x as 1 minus x squared times p. And now this is multiplied by the magnitude of vector r squared raised to the negative 1. And this is all divided by, we have the magnitude of vector r raised to the pth power. And we'll rewrite this one more time for good looks. So I got 1 minus x squared times p multiplied by the magnitude of vector r raised to the negative 2 divided by the magnitude of vector r raised to the p power. So this is the form that we're going to use. And again, if you don't simplify like this, you'll still get the same answer in the end as long as your algebra and your differentiation is accurate and consistent. But this way, we don't have so many x's and y's to worry about. So now we need to go ahead and apply a similar process to attain the partial derivatives of g with respect to y and h with respect to z. So let's just really quick note here, since we know that the partial derivative of f with respect to x, we've defined this as 1 minus x squared times p multiplied by the magnitude of vector r raised to the negative 2 all over the magnitude of vector r 
raised to the power of p, we can safely assume the partial derivatives for g with respect to y and the partial derivative of h with respect to z will be performed in a similar manner. So I'll leave the exact computation up to you. But what we should end up with, we can say it is safe to assume the following. So it is safe to assume that for our g component, which here is defined as y divided by x squared plus y squared plus z squared, all raised to the power of p divided by 2, using the partial derivative of f with respect to x, we can conclude that the partial derivative of g with respect to y is going to be equal to 1 minus y squared times p multiplied by the magnitude of vector r raised to the negative 2, all divided by the magnitude of vector r raised to the pth power. And very similarly for our h component, we know that this here is defined as z divided by x squared plus y squared plus z squared raised to the power of p divided by 2, Using the partial derivative of f with respect to x, we can safely assume that the partial derivative of h with respect to z is going to be equal to 1 minus z squared times p multiplied by the magnitude of vector r raised to the negative 2, all divided by the magnitude of vector r raised to the p. So, and again, I... I encourage you to, to verify these partial derivatives. Do that same computation out. But here we have the partial derivative of f with respect to x. We have the partial derivative of g with respect to y. And the partial derivative of h with respect to z. And we're ready now to find or to compute the divergence. So we're ready now to compute or to calculate the divergence of the vector, the radial vector field. And we, of course, recall that the divergence of a vector field is defined as the dot product of the del operator with that vector field. And this, by definition, is equal to the sum of the partial derivatives. We have the partial derivative of f with respect to x plus the partial derivative of g with respect to y plus the partial derivative of h with respect to z. And we'll go ahead now and plug in what we just found. And now to save us a little time here, let's make a little love note to ourselves. Looking at all three of these partial derivatives, we realize to our delight that they all have the same denominator. Woohoo! So when we take the sum of the three parts here, we can immediately put everything under that single denominator. So we have the from the partial derivative of f with respect to x, we have 1 minus x squared times p multiplied by the magnitude of vector r raised to the negative 2 plus from the partial derivative of g with respect to y, we have 1 minus y squared times p multiplied by the magnitude of vector r raised to the negative 2, plus from the partial derivative of h with respect to z, we have 1 minus z squared multiplied by p multiplied by the magnitude of vector r raised to the negative 2, and again, they all have the same denominator, so we put this under one single denominator, the magnitude of vector r raised to the power of p. All right, and now we can simplify. We're almost there. So let's look at the numerator here, and we realize we have three constants that we can combine. We have 1 plus 1 plus 1, which gives us 3. And then notice with the three remaining terms that we have a greatest common factor here of p or minus p times the magnitude of vector r raised to the negative 2. So we can factor that out. So this will be 3 minus p times the magnitude of vector r raised to the negative 2. And that's going to be multiplied by the terms that are left over. So we're left, we have x squared plus y squared plus z squared all left over. And this is all still divided by the magnitude of vector r raised to the p power. 
Now we're getting excited. We can see it happening. We see this x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And we, of course, know that the magnitude of vector r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So let's plug this in. So I have 3 minus p times the magnitude of vector r raised to the negative 2 multiplied by the magnitude of vector r raised to the positive 2, all divided by the magnitude of vector r raised to the power of p. And by properties of exponents, we can combine these two magnitudes, giving us 3 minus p times the magnitude of vector r raised to the negative 2 plus 2, which gives us 0, all over the magnitude of vector r raised to the power of p, and we see, or we know, anything raised to the zero goes to one, which leaves us with what we wanted. Woohoo! We have here, or we're left with, three minus p all over the magnitude of vector r raised to the power of p as the divergence of this radial field. And so our proof is complete.